Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Critical Thinkers in Religion, Law, and Social Theory. Um, this afternoon's speaker is Linda Woodhead from Lancaster University. Oh, Linda, I'm sorry. Sorry. I never give long introductions, Linda, so I'm speaking loudly now. <laughs> Linda is from the University of Lancaster. She's professor of sociology of religion at Lancaster. Um, I think probably most of you know her work and know it well. I'm just going to list a few of her publications. Uh, Everyday lived religion. Pardon me. Everyday lived Islam in Europe by Ashgate 2013. Religion and change in modern Britain. Routledge 2012. And a sociology of religious emotion. Oxford University Press. 2011. Um, Linda is always at the cutting edge of whatever we're thinking about about religion, uh, and so it was, um, I thought, a good idea to perhaps have her give this address, which also coincides with the annual meeting of the Religion and Diversity Project. So for those of you who haven't been here all day, um, there's a whole cohort of people in this room who belong to the Religion and Diversity Project. And that project has a fairly heavy presence in my department, the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, and also sometimes on campus. So um, at the reception at the end, I'd encourage you to maybe um, mingle and introduce yourselves to people you don't know. I know that's often really painful, but um, it, it, there's a whole group of these religion and diversity types. And I so I recognize in the crowd people who come to this series regularly and then all the religion and diversity people. So, you know, talk amongst yourselves at the end. Um, I just want to thank my co-organizer, Andre Le Liberté, who's here back there. Thank you, Andre, as always. Uh, Sonia Sika, who's not here. We've inconveniently scheduled these lectures when she's teaching. Um, otherwise, she'd be here. Elke Winter. Um, who's not here, I think she's um, on leave or sabbatical at some, uh, somewhere at this point. Um, so without further ado, um, Linda today, the title of her talk, Four Reasons Why Religion Has Changed and Will Never Be the Same Again. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much and uh, thank you all for coming. Can, can you hear me okay at the back? So, uh, a very bold title and a very bold claim. Um, it's based on my whole life of research, I suppose, and thinking about these topics, but more immediately, the, the evidence I want to be drawing on to try and talk about this topic is from a big research program that's very similar to the one that Laurie, who's just spoken, is running. So this is Laurie's program here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I've been running a kind of sister program in the UK, which has just finished, but it ran from 2007 to 2013, and it commissioned 75 different projects. Most universities in the UK were involved in it. It was a very big investment in religion research in Britain, in recognition that it had been a very neglected subject for a long time. So it was trying to get people from right across the spectrum of academic disciplines to look at religion together again. So I've had the privilege to look at the findings coming out from all those, all those projects on that. And I ended up this big research initiative by commissioning a couple of large national polls. Because the, the great thing about being at the end of the research project was that we knew which questions we wanted to ask by that point. <laughs> or we knew we had some small scale case studies and projects, we wanted to see if their findings were actually representative. So we were able to do that using a couple of very large surveys just in the UK. So I'll be drawing on some of that survey evidence, I'll show you a little bit of relevant bits there, and I'll be drawing on uh, research I've been doing around the world. This lecture keeps changing, I've given different versions, and uh, it's a bit like John Calvin's Institute, so he just kept rewriting the same, not, not the same quality, but in that he kept rewriting it version after version. And I've tried to tailor this one, and I keep changing my mind about elements of it. I've tried to tailor this version to this context, and I've focused it particularly on Christianity and how that's been changing. Just a brief mention of some other religions. So, 
my argument is that since 1989, something very big has shifted. I'm not arguing that everything has changed. I'm arguing that it have been a very, very long process of change, well over a century, but that at the end of the 80s, we reached a tipping point. So that one mode of religion, one way of being religious, became more important than the way that had been dominant for a very long time before. But they both still coexist. So I'm not going to be talking about from X to Y. I'll be talking about X and Y are still there, but Y is dominant in this area, or they're fighting with each other. It's more that kind of a scenario that I'll be talking about. And of course, anyone with any, any historian in the room will say, well, religion is always changing, and of course that is true. And we do like to overestimate the importance of the changes that we live through. But I think this is a particularly significant point of change, perhaps particularly for countries that were influenced by the Reformation, both Catholic and Protestant. I think there's something about the Reformation mode of religion that is no longer dominant anymore. We can argue about its wider importance and its, the extent of the significance in the questions. Uh, so, with no more hesitation, let me go through the four ways in which I think religion has changed. And here's my first one. And this is the, the one where I do think there has been a complete change, because I think that all religion now has become post-traditional in the sense that it has to be reflexive. What do I mean by that? Uh, I'm being a little autobiographical here. This is my primary school in Somerset, in the southwest of England. It's the local state primary school, which, like a lot of primary schools, is a Church of England primary school. And I was glad to see on the web when I produced this that it's still there. And opposite it is still the church. So. When I went to school, I reckon I was about the last generation for whom their, not just Christianity, but Anglicanism was just, uh, it was default, it was just the truth. It wasn't that we were taught Christianity, it wasn't that we were taught Anglicanism, it was, we never even thought about it. This was just how things were. This was just life. That's gone. That way of being unreflective about your, about your religion, because it is just how everyone thinks and what everyone in a place does, I think that has gone everywhere in the world now. People have to be somewhat more self-conscious about their religion. In a sense, all religious identity now is a contested achievement because people are aware that there are alternatives. They're aware of alternatives within their own tradition. They're aware of different religious traditions. And they're aware that you don't have to be religious at all. No religion, various sorts of atheism are significant options. So even if you still go to the Church of England primary school, and at some point later in life you decide you are still an Anglican, you're making that decision in a way that is reflexive. And you're also very often required to know a bit more about your religion, to be able to articulate what it is. If anyone had asked us, what's Anglicanism, we wouldn't have known what the word meant. Now people are much more likely to be, you know, Church of England is constantly producing little vision statements and mission statements and catechisms and codifications, and it's even got a logo since the 1990s. It's got a press office now. All those things are pretty new. This is a picture that I took last month, and uh, I was doing some research in Israel amongst Haredim, amongst ultra-Orthodox Jews. This is a bookshop in Haifa, and uh, I was very interested in well, this nice gentleman, let me just 
mill around in the shop all day and talk to the customers. And they turned out to be uh, a lot of young, particularly men, and many from all around the world where there is a Jewish diaspora, but quite a lot from the United States who had gone there to work and were coming back this in the summer, coming back on holiday or to see relatives. Uh, and I was talking to them, as well as Israelis, about why they're attracted to this very strict form of Judaism. My point making and showing you this picture, partly I love it because if a religion of the book, I mean it's a perfect illustration of the religion of the book, isn't it? This books, books, books everywhere. Uh, partly, but I show it because you might say this is an incredibly traditional form of religion, which in many ways it is. It tries to keep alive uh, that kind of Judaism that existed from 18th century in Eastern Europe, uh, and it's in a way trying to reclaim it from the Holocaust, tr from the fact that it was tried, people tried to wipe it out, and they're saying that here we still are, with our traditions, doing things in the same way. But the young, the young men, even they're still choosing. I mean, you might be traditional, but you're choosing to be traditional. And quite a few of the young men said that it was only when they'd left Israel that they realised this was what they wanted and they wanted to, be, to do it properly, to be Jewish properly. And that's why I came back to choose that, to do that, and to learn more about what it would be to do that properly. It's interesting as well because those of you who know about, about uh, this form of religion will know that it's growing, ultra-Orthodoxy, and also that... Uh, What's really new about it is that, the, is that the ideal is for all men to spend their whole lives studying, to be full-time scholars. So the women go out to work to support them. They're also supported on welfare, which is highly controversial uh, in the countries that supply welfare. Uh, but what's new, of course, is that all men want to do this. Traditionally, it would have been very few. It wouldn't have been economically possible for all men. But now we all want to do it for ourselves. So it's old, but also new, and that everyone's wanting to be uh, full-time scholars. Second change. The second change isn't a big shift like that. It's that the two modes coexist, and that the traditional way, the traditional modes of rigid authority are in crisis. They've been overwhelmed, they're being overwhelmed by new sorts of religious leadership or authority, but they haven't given up power. So religions around the world are still led by men, and I say that deliberately of course, who exercise a mode of authority and leadership which is traditional, but that leadership is less and less accepted by the majority of religious people. That's the crisis I'm talking about. So a clash between older, and I'm using Max Weber's classification of types of religious authority here, or authority in general, traditional authority, bureaucratic, and new, more, I'm saying that now the new mode is more of what he talked about as charismatic. So traditional authority, uh, your authority resides in the fact that you represent the tradition, what's handed down, you're, you're validated through that relationship. <coughs> Bureaucratic modes, of course, come in with, uh, with the modern world and have more to do with uh, applying uh, rational procedures that are authorised in a bureaucratic context. Religions in the modern world combine both those modes. But those modes aren't what most people, particularly younger people these days, find convincing. What they find authoritative is both their own judgment and intuition on the whole, partly going back to the reflexive point, we would like to test things and see if they're authentic for ourselves. But it's not just that we're taking authority from ourselves, people are still very much interested in and sometimes convinced by and listen to figures they find inspiring figures people find spiritually inspiring go back to my picture 
this guy was clearly someone that he 